Hey, are you thinking about building yourself a new computer system because you're running Photoshop and Premiere Pro and everything is just too slow? Check out this week's episode of Hands On Tech. We got some great tips for you. This is Twit. This episode of Hands On Tech is brought to you by iFixit. Visit ifixit.com slash hot to get $10 off your next $50 fix. Hey folks, I'm Matt Pruitt, and this is Hands On Tech here on twit.tv. Folks, the holiday season is among us, and you're gonna probably get your hands on some gift cards and things of that nature, or you're gonna wait until the new year when you have all of these sales, and you're gonna say, you know what? I wanna get myself a nice computer because I'm getting serious about this photography thing. I wanna take better shots, I wanna process better shots. I even wanna shoot some video and process some beautiful video footage, but I need a computer system that's gonna get all of that done. Well, I got you squared away right now. We were able to team up with the folks at Puget Systems to join us here on this week's episode of Hands On Technology. And joining us today is my man, Mr. Matt Bach, Senior Hardware Analyst at Puget Systems. Did I get that right? Yeah, you got that exactly right, Ann. Thank you. (laughs) How you doing, my man? Good, good. Appreciate you joining us today here on uh, twit.tv. Like I said, this is that time of year where people are starting to get the itch for getting themselves new gear, Uh, especially in the photography side of things in the video world. You you, you want a new cameras, you want a new lenses, and you start to upgrade those cameras to give you all of these beautiful extra megapixels and C logs and S logs and all of this fancy stuff. And then you go and try to throw it on your laptop and your laptop just pukes on you. Just, Mm -hmm. no, this is not gonna work. So the next phase is, we need some type of system to get rolling with this. I wanted to ask you today, some different options out there for people that are really wanting to step their game up. We'll start with, say, the beginner photographer, if you will. They just got themselves a copy of Photoshop or Affinity or what have you, and they're saying, you know what, what can I do? What kind of computer can I build Uh, to give myself a better experience and get these photos processed a lot more efficiently. So what what are your thoughts on that? Where would they start? So honestly, there's a lot of like the fun side where you can be talking about performance that people like to talk about, like, you know, your processor and your video card and all that jazz. Uh, But I actually usually try to tell people to take a step back Mm -hmm. And look at the things that are really essential, like the kind of the foundation first. And that's going to be your storage, honestly. Oh, man. Everyone, (laughs) like, you know, everyone understands storage (laughs) to some degree, but it's, you need to make sure that you've got enough and then you've got fast enough storage, or it doesn't matter how fast the rest of the computer is going to be. You can drop 10 grand on crazy (laughs) hardware. And if you're running everything off of like an old platter drive, it's not going to matter. Oh, my God. So the first thing we always tell people is storage, storage, storage. And it's, um, you basically just want to be using SSDs whenever you can. So that's that's the big thing. Get your OS on an SSD. Uh, get like Lightroom installed on an SSD. Um, and then when you get to your actual files, like mm-hmm. your photographs, mm-hmm. then it just depends on exactly what you're working with. If it's not really high res stuff, you can get away with a platter drive. They're a lot cheaper. Right. They're pretty fast these days. But once you get jumping up into the you know 40, 50 megapixel, you're shooting in you know really high res raw. Right. That's where you might want to be jumping up to a solid state drive to even store your photos on. Now, when I go to Amazon.com, for example, or mm-hmm. or, or and just start searching for SSDs, man, you yeah. get a gazillion pages of them. So, yeah. what what do you recommend? Like, if if we were to hop in at Puget Systems, I'm sure there's a bunch of different SSD options. I mean, is it does it really matter? Is it the brand? Is it a, a certain spec yeah. that we should look for? Uh, the main thing, honestly, that I recommend is Samsung SSDs. Um, there's a lot of great brands. We've used Samsung for years now. Mm-hmm. And the reason why that we haven't swapped to anything else is just because they're so good. Yeah, uh, the reliability <laughs> is just insane. Nice. Um, I think out of something like a thousand drives, we have to replace one. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's an insanely low failure rate. It's, these Samsung drives are failing at you know less rate than even like processors. So it's wow. it's pretty nuts how good they are. So that's just my recommendation right there is like Samsung. And then between there's a bunch of different drives out there. They have their 860 line uh, between Pro and Evo, and then they got like 970s. I think for most people you can stick with the Evo when it comes to f- photography. The Pro lines mostly just get you. 
um, endurance, so a higher number of writes. But when you're just doing, you know, you're putting photographs on there and they kind of stay there, it's not a big deal. Right. Uh, so stick with the Evos. There's really not a reason to spend more money on the Pro lines. Right. So now with that story, with, with storage in mind, we're still just looking more so at performance and we're looking at larger capacity so we have an ssd but what if we're somebody that's been shooting for a year you know we're just getting Mm -hmm. started but a year's worth of photography is still a lot of data are we are we going to be able to put that on one ssd or do you have a secondary drive option so should we look at say like a platter drive yeah and that's that's exactly exactly right Uh, so you can get pretty large ssds these days like Mm -hmm. four terabytes or so but yeah like you said that's not really a year's worth of shooting so uh yeah, we try to recommend like an SSD as like basically your working drive, like active projects. You just finish a shoot, you put it on there so that when you're doing your editing, you can be, you know, sw- switching between images really fast and, you know, just being in your process. And then when you're done with that project, that's when you can move it off to a platter drive that you have internal into the system um, for like short term storage or short term backup, I should say. And then you have to get into like cloud backup or external drives and those kind of things for long term. Because, yeah, like you said before, the space fills up fast. You're not going to be able to keep everything internal long term. It fills up quickly and it could start to cost a lot of money if you're not careful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now storage is out of the way. What What is the <laughs> next thing a beginner should look into? Is it a particular type of monitor? Is it a certain RAM? Uh, a processing? Yeah. I would say RAM, actually, that's a perfect okay. one. So RAM uh, is fairly straightforward, though. We typically say for like a beginner, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, and this applies whether it's a laptop or a desktop, 16 gigs of RAM is really like the minimum these okay. days. Uh, and then 32, once you get up into a little bit more advanced, uh, there's usually not much of a reason to go above that for photography. Okay. Um, once you get into like you want to do some video, then you might want to get up to 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, but 32 gig is about the max that you really need. Um, and the, the other thing about RAM that I always tell people is don't worry about speed. The only thing you really need to worry about is how much RAM there is. There's a lot of like really high performance RAM kits that you can buy that are really expensive. And in the end, they don't really make any difference in terms of actual real world performance. I am so glad to hear a professional <laughs> say that out loud instead of all of the, the pundits like myself out there preaching. <laughs> you need to get faster RAM. Just, well, just. It, it's. It, it's always it, it's a hard balance. Um, so I mean, there is small amounts of performance you can get with this higher performance RAM. But the things that we always find is that the reliability tends to drop fairly drastically once you get beyond what the processor supports. Oh, the really? memory controllers on the processor, and once you get beyond that, then the failure rate starts to go up. The you know. Lightroom's going to crash more or Capture One or anything, or your system's going to blue screen. Oh, so it, in our view, at least from a workstation manufacturer, is that 2 5% extra performance you can get is not worth the chance of a blue screen or Lightroom crashing. Because how much perform or how much time do you lose when an application <laughs> crashes versus getting a few percent, you know, constantly? Well, there's the amount of time that you spend cussing and fussing at it at because it crashed <laughs> there's the amount of time you wait on it to come back up and then there's the cool down period because you walked away from frustration yeah you're losing a lot of time a lot exactly. of time yeah so, <laughs> so th- that's that's the way we advise uh, i mean there's a lot of people who are really heavy enthusiast diyers they can take more risks because they understand what's going on they adju- they understand how to adjust things uh, but if you're not one of those people then there's no reason to go with that really really essentially overclocking of your RAM. It's just not worth it in the end, at least from my opinion. So now we have storage and RAM to be considered. Mm -hmm. From a beginner standpoint, what is a typical price range they should expect to spend? Because I know I have people messaging me in, in so, on social media, like, I need to buy a computer, but I only want to spend $300. And I yeah. tell them, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, I mean, even if you're not a photographer, photographer, no, $300 yeah. is not going to cut it. You can get pretty darn good performance at a fairly low cost these days. Um, our, the systems we tend to sell are a bit higher end, uh, simply because, I mean, that, those are the kind of people who are going to come to a custom manufacturer like us. That's correct. Uh, but typically, they would start somewhere around $2,000, $3,000. I, I think three k is about our... Uh, default options and you Mm -hmm. can go down a bit you can go up you know a lot Mm -hmm. but um, I'd say somewhere around you could probably get pretty darn good performance out of about a thousand dollars if you you know really honed in on exactly what you need right Uh, 
And I think a lot of that actually comes down to your choice of processor and video card. So, I mean, we talked about storage, we talked about RAM. Those are like the foundation things. Mm -hmm. And then when you get actually into like performance, then it's going to be your processor and GPU. Right. Um, and actually, I want to leave processor for last because yep. that's the most interesting one. Oh, yeah. Uh, video card is the one that is a lot simpler. Uh, it's basically you want a discrete video card. So not just video that's built into the processor, but an actual card that you're actually going to be installing. Uh, and you don't need to go much. Um, Lightroom, they've been adding more and more GPU acceleration. Photoshop has had it. Um, I'm actually not sure what stage Capture One is at, but uh, you don't need a ton. Once you get to a mid-range card, like a $200 card, mm -hmm. you don't get much more out of going higher than that, at least today. They're doing a lot of work on it, but I, I expect it to be at least several years before there's a reason to buy a $1,000 video card. So no reason to do it today. Yeah, our, 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 our guys on uh, This Week in Computer Hardware, our, our other show here, Twitch <laughs> is what it's called. They've mentioned that a couple times as far as uh, graphics card performance versus dollars spent. They've mentioned pretty yeah. much the same thing you just said. Uh, so let, let's take a step up to not just the beginner getting started, but the enthusiast that's been at it a little while and they're now trying to dabble into other things. They're moving from that, that crop sensor to the full frame <laughs> lens and, and camera and, and starting to shoot a little bit more of this 4K video that you see out mm -hmm. on stuff like the Sony A7 line. And, and they're wanting to get a, get a little bit more serious. They're not pros just yet, but they, they, mm -hmm. can, they got a twinkle in their eye and they're ready to try to take this, this business off the ground and get rolling with it. So what do you recommend someone on that level <clears throat> that is shooting mm -hmm. a lot more, creating a whole lot more content and using bigger files, essentially? Yeah. Oh, I think there's a couple of things to consider. Um, like you said, there's bigger files, so you're going to need bigger storage. You're uh, probably not that much faster of storage, honestly, but maybe a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's going to need more storage. Uh, the big thing is going to come into your choice of processor, and that's really where you're going to sink your budget when you're trying to get better performance that you can actually work with these higher um, resolution files, um, getting into like video and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And right now it's actually fairly straightforward uh, for people who are primarily photographers. Uh, and that's because um, AMD and Intel just launched a whole range of CPUs. And there's one of those that is really good for t photography, and that's AMD's Ryzen processors. Mm -hmm. uh, they are- I'm a just, Ryzen user. Yeah, they're insanely good. Um, some applications like Photoshop, they are they really only use like one core, so there's not a huge difference between any different CPU. You could spend two grand on a CPU, and it's gonna be about the same as a you know, three or $400 CPU. Right. Um, other ones like Lightroom, uh, mm -hmm. there are specific tasks like exporting that really can't take advantage of higher core counts. And specifically with the AMD processors, there's something in them. There's some secret sauce that makes them insanely good for exporting. Uh, and so you mostly just want to be getting a Ryzen processor. And then it's just the higher up you go that stack, the more money you spend, the better uh, mostly things like exporting is going to be. Uh, you know, like culling and that kind of process isn't going to be that much different with a faster processor. But it's all about being able to export. Right. And it's insane how much faster it is. Um, you compare it to a couple of generations ago, we're talking, you know, two times faster with like the Ryzen CPUs. And if you really need crazy export uh, performance, you can, you know, cut those export times in half again by going up to one of the really, really expensive thread rippers. But right. honestly, like once you're to the point where you're going to be exporting 500 pictures in a couple of minutes, does it really matter that it's that much faster? <laughs> no, it's still <laughs> 500 images. Goodness. <laughs> yeah. So at, at that point, that's where you start to get beyond like, your computer's about as good as it's going to be uh, for those kind of tasks. So that's when you'd want to be looking into like, well, hey, is there some lens that would actually help me more for my photography? Is there some monitor? Do I, do I need to start looking into getting a, a true 10-bit display so that I can actually see all of these things? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, anything else, you know, beyond that that's more you know, around your computer. This episode of Hands-On Tech is brought to you by iFixit. If you got a cracked screen, or bad battery in your phone, iFixit makes it easy to fix your iOS or Android device yourself with their all-in-one fix kits. In the kit, you get the parts and tools backed by industry-leading warranty and step-by-step -step instructions with amazing photos and videos to show you how it's done. They even have kits for the tiny devices like the Apple Watch. Visit ifixit.com hot 
to get $10 off your next $50 fix. That's ifixit.com slash hot. But what, but what I, if they're I, getting started with Premiere Pro, you know, or, yeah. or, or DaVinci or what have you? Because a lot of the, the noise out there in the mm -hmm. world of information is you need X amount of cores to, to run Premiere Pro and, and, and mm -hmm. DaVinci and so forth. And you need X amount of cycles per second. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? What, what, what should they look for if they're seriously, a, seriously thinking about doing a lot more 4K video footage? I know 1080p has yeah. been a little bit easier to handle nowadays on those apps, but 4K could still be a challenge for some systems, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, yeah, oh, it definitely can. Um, th those Ryzen CPUs are actually very, very good for um, like Premiere Pro, DaVinci Resolve, any of those ones, uh, the Ryzen CPUs are terrific also. Um, there is some things that I, I, I kind of want to talk about really quickly that um, more to get past what people say on the internet and it's not really true. Uh, <laughs> there are some reasons that people say you should buy an Intel processor and it's because they have what's called Quick Sync and yeah. that's what Premiere Pro uses to accelerate H.264 and HEVC decoding and encoding. Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to let you process H.264 uh, media way faster, which is what most you know, people who are using photography cameras, or that's right. what it's going to be recording in. Right. The problem is that really is super duper helpful for laptops. But once you get up to like a desktop, the performance of the CPU basically just overshadows it. It, it really doesn't get you that much for actually like, um, you know, live playback. It, it can help with some exporting some, but again, it's all about when you're in your process and creative, like you, you don't want to be dropping frames left and right. right. Uh, so yeah, I, I think still for the like uh, beginner through like uh, I, I guess mid level, mm -hmm. the AMD Ryzen's are terrific, uh, and it's really only when you get to the higher level that you're going to be looking at something even above that. I have a I'm, I'm actually due for a new build, but mm -hmm. this is still me patting myself on the back <laughs> because I'm running a Ryzen five um, CPU and I've not had any issues with it, and I've had it for about two years and. Mm. I throw 4K at it just fine. We recently um, tested a um, 6K RAW camera mm. and ran it just fine. Um, so, so yeah, AMD, they're, they're not something that you can just, just dismiss right now, even though no. NASA wants I, to sort of jump on the Intel train. <laughs> yeah, I would say right now AMD has the lead in terms of just pure performance uh, for your dollar or absolute, especially in the video fields. Like their Threadripper CPUs are absolutely amazing. The previous generations, they had some issues um, in applications like Premiere or Photoshop just from how they worked. But mm -hmm. they pretty much fixed all of those and they're ones that they just launched the third generation ones. And so they are just really really good they're expensive uh, <laughs> but it's cool seeing this competition from amd because right when amd launched these intel launched their own new x series but they had a price cut of like in half so intel had to cut the prices <laughs> in half in order to kind of be competitive with amd and that just kind of tells you how much amd is doing right yeah, now they, they, um, they made intel call their bluff essentially yeah now, there are definitely some reasons to stick with Intel. Um, mm -hmm. We do for a, a lot of our customers, and it primarily comes down to two things. One, Intel platforms that are out right now have been out for a lot longer. Right. So uh, they're just, they have less launch day bugs and things like that. So if you want a system that just works and the performance is going to be about on par, a lot of people just go with Intel just because it's been around for a long right. time. Right. Uh, the second is Thunderbolt. Um, and this comes up especially with a lot of our customers that, either were on Mac and moved to PC or they have a mixed workflow where they have both Macs and PCs mm -hmm. and Thunderbolt is huge mm -hmm. uh, for those kind of people. And AMD platforms don't have any certified Thunderbolt support. Right. Uh, there are some boards out there that have Thunderbolt, but it's not officially certified. Right. And man, Thunderbolt on PC, especially on desktops, mm -hmm. uh, can be really finicky. Um, so we try to point people towards Intel who need Thunderbolt simply because we know it's going to work right. at least on the boards we carry. It's a lot better on laptops because, you know, the laptop manufacturer actually controls everything. They control the motherboard, they control the Thunderbolt device, they control everything. Right. But on a desktop, you're mixing and matching a lot of stuff and that can cause issues with something as complicated as Thunderbolt. Right. Now, lastly, we're going to mm -hmm. take a look at the big dog professional been doing this for several years now and it's time for them to upgrade you know we've just had all of this talk about the latest mac pro and and mm -hmm. all of its glory 
with hardware and, and, and everything that you can throw at it. And it costs as, about as much as a used BMW. Um, but what about the folks that, that are wanting to stick to windows and they're ready to go out and pick all of their parts to build their magical machine for all of their pro jobs? Money is not yeah. an object here. Go. Well, yeah, there's... See, it's fun when you, when you say money's not an object because there's still just a certain point where money just doesn't matter. Uh-huh. Um, well, it, it just doesn't get you anything more. Uh, so main thing with someone who's at that level is they do need more system memory or RAM. Uh, mm-hmm. For those people, usually we go all the way up to about 128 gigs. Uh, video card starts to come into play uh, a little bit because of performance, but a lot of it because of what's called the video memory, VRAM. VRAM. And you need to have enough. Uh, and So like you want to run multiple cards? cards? No, you don't need multiple cards. Okay. Uh, you just need one because uh, multiple cards, you don't get to add up the VRAM together. You actually use whatever's the smallest, okay. which is unfortunate. Uh, but it's mostly like if you're doing 4K, most cards out there are going to be fine. They have 8 gigs or so is most most mainstream cards. Uh, but once you get up to 6K or 8K, then you need to be getting up into these cards that have uh, 10 or 11 gigs. Uh, if you, you want to use something like DaVinci Resolve and mm-hmm. edit in 8K, then you need to go up to these cards that have like 24 gigs of, Ooh, of video wee. memory. And at that point, you have to take the, a step from the GeForce cards, which are honestly terrific cards. They're more than stable enough for most editors. Uh, you have to make the price jump up to the Quadro cards, which are a lot more yeah, expensive, the but they have the video memory. They're not really faster. Right. It's just the video memory. Right. And they're always so much more expensive. I remember looking at Quadro cards uh, uh, several years ago and was thinking I'll probably never be able to afford those. Oh. <laughs> but those people who have the, those insane budgets and they really need it, if they're working mm-hmm. with 8K raw, uh, you, you might need to make that jump. Um, it, but then it gets up into the CPU and the CPU is really going to be where it sets people apart. You're not going to be looking at a Ryzen at that point. You're probably either going to be looking at the X series from Intel right. or the Threadrippers. Um, and if money is no object, you're going to go with Threadripper. Um, Threadripper, okay. Yeah. Things like live playback is not actually faster with Threadripper or X-Series. They're about the same. But, again, it comes down to, like, exporting. Export. That's where, I mean, if you're working on, like, a two-hour special for Netflix. Right. Yeah, you probably want to be able to export a little bit faster. Get it done, baby. Days. Get it done. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So, I love it. So that that's some good stuff. So if, if money is not an object... What are you thinking that budget just may be at that point? Usually at that point, we're talking somewhere in the eight to $10,000 range. Um, some people go higher, but the people who go higher is because they just want a huge amount of internal storage. But usually when they're up to that level, uh, a lot of people will have network attached storage that they offload all their stuff onto or work directly off of. So yeah, usually we don't end up selling systems that are much more than about 10,000, uh, even for really, really high end video work. Right. Right. That's 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 still an amazing budget. It's just a lot of money. I want to sit down at that rig. <laughs> <laughs> I want to sit at that rig and go through some footage. My goodness. Mm-hmm. So now, before we get out of here, tell us all how we get in touch with you you over there at Puget and let everybody know, you know, a little bit of what you guys can offer to the beginner, to the mid-range. I'm just I'm still trying to get to the next level yeah. all the way up to the pro. Where can we find you, Mr. Bob? Sure. So we're on PugetSystems.com, and there's contact us forums. There's a lot of once you get to like our actual buy pages. So we, we like to list things by software, actually. So like, oh, I'm a Lightroom user. Mm-hmm. Then there's like a lot of times contact us forums. And that's really what we try to do. Like we have configure pages, but in the end, like us talking to you is going to be how we can figure out and work with you. Uh, to get you into the exact right thing because i mean budget is different for everybody people use different applications together they're using shooting with different uh, cameras and, mm-hmm. and formats and making all of those things work together is kind of our specialty like we don't just throw parts in a box and say eh, it'll probably work uh so we, <laughs> we spend a lot of time it's, you know you will have two customers that like at first it looks like they're doing the same thing but they end up with different configurations because right. everybody is a little bit unique in what they do that's uh, awesome so, so that's the big thing with us, uh, you know, the purchasing of the system, but it's also the, the post support is a huge thing for us. Like if you're having an issue with Premiere or Lightroom or whatever, it can be sometimes really hard to get uh, support from like Adobe. Um, you just you have to find the right person to talk to and then they'll take care of it. Yep. But uh, so we try to be that extra intermediary level. If you got an issue, you can come to us first. We oftentimes already know the solution to what that problem is awesome. or we can start leveraging our contacts with Adobe or Blackmagic or 
whoever. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Mr. Bach, thank you again for joining us here on Hands on Tech. I really do appreciate the insight that you offered myself, as well as all of our listeners and viewers out there, because again, this is the most wonderful time of the year where everybody starts clamoring for some new shiny tech. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Mr. Bach. Absolutely. Thank you, Ant. All right, folks, that is it for this episode of Hands On Tech here on twit.tv. Thank you again for watching us and, and sharing out all the episodes that we have here on the network. It's a lot of fun bringing this content to you, and we hope to continue to provide you some great information, some great tools, and some great resources such as Puget Systems. Be sure to hit the subscribe button in your favorite podcatcher of choice and give us a follow over on the social medias. Follow us on Twitter at twit. That's twit on Twitter. And also you can give us a follow on Instagram because, hey, we're talking about photography, right? So follow twit.tv on Instagram and you'll be able to check out all of the behind the scenes stuff that goes on and have a lot of fun with this on the social medias. All right, folks, I'm Matt Pruitt. We'll catch you on the next episode of Hands On Tech. Get out there, create, and dominate. See you. Keep up with all the hottest tech news and gadgets. Visit twit.tv. There you'll be able to find and subscribe to all our tech shows. Thanks for watching Hands on Tech.